class of exceptional Californians. Take a minute to locate your seat number and find your designated seat. The program will begin in just a few minutes.
Once again, welcome to the 13th California Hall of Fame induction ceremony. As we get closer to the beginning of tonight's ceremony, please take this opportunity to take your seat and silence your cell phone. Our program will begin shortly.
to oversee tonight's ceremony, please welcome Master Sergeant Rebecca Walkenhauer from the California State Guard and First Sergeant Josh Baker from the California Air National Guard. And now, please welcome the 13th class of California Hall of Fame inductees. Dr. Maya Angelou, represented by her son, Guy Johnson. <laughs> Tony Hawk. Helen Turley, Wolfgang Puck, RuPaul Andre Charles, Jean Wakasuki Houston. Dr. Franz Cordova, represented by her brother, Fred Cordova. George Lopez. Reverend James Lawson, Jr. And Brandy Chastain. Please welcome the chair of the California Museum Board of Trustees, Richard Costigan. All right, well, good evening. I appreciate you all being here and have to go through a few housekeeping issues to begin with. First of all, um, I love the photos, thank you. But if your cell phone is on, please turn it off. All right, well, good evening. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the California Museum, welcome to the induction ceremony of the 13th class of the California Hall of Fame. I'd like to welcome the governor, who's not here yet, first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, the Honorable Betty Yee. Uh, it's my understanding that Mayor Steinberg is here. Uh, the Honorable Todd Gloria from San Diego. And then other members of the governor's staff, other administration officials, distinguished guests and friends. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge some of the past Cal California Hall of Fame inductees and their families that, who are here. Uh, Dolores Horta, where are you, ma'am? Uh, Arlene Blum, right over here. Stand up, please. Uh, Charlotte Schultz, who's here for her husband, the Honorable George P. Schultz. I believe Lisa Demetrius is here, the granddaughter of Charles and Ray Ames. Where are you? Stephen Graham, where are you, sir? The son of Robert Graham who created our medals that will be given to the Hall of Fame inductees this evening. Thank you for being here. Alicia Gwynn, I understand you're here too, Tony Gwynn's wife. And if I missed you, my apologies. Uh, are there any in other inductees here? Great. All right. Well, tonight we embark on one of the most inspiring and humbling events that the California Museum has. Uh, we will hear and see inspiring stories of those for whom California is intertwined in their souls and identity. It is the commonality of being a Californian. Whether you've just arrived here or have been here for generations, that's what gathers us all here tonight. The California Hall of Fame is the signature event at the California Museum, but I just want to recap for a moment other activities the California Museum engages in over the years. We focus on our mission of leadership, unity, and education. 
In 2017, the California Museum, in partnership with Mayor Daryl Steinberg and then Governor Jerry Brown, opened the Unity Center. It's the first of its kind in the nation interactive exhibit. The Unity Center has been a gathering place as our nation struggles with the current divides we face today and is shaped by the tragedies of the past and the hopes of tomorrow. Our primary mission of the California Museum is to educate. Throughout the year, our exhibits, programs, speakers, museums, camps all focus on this goal. A few weeks ago, we had the honor of hosting speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, on a day-long event on women's writing votes. And in 2019, we're going to be bringing two great events here. We're going to be opening the Chinese California Stories, Gold Mountains, and a new remarkable women's exhibit. The reason I talk about these is while everybody focuses on this event, it is really our sponsors that help us throughout the year. And these events and events like this would not be possible without our sponsors. And I'd like to thank of a couple of them real quick. Visit California, who'll be up next. <laughs> Pharma, Southern California Edison, Frontier, Genentech, River City Bank, Western Dental, and many more. Uh, in addition to our sponsors, the event would not be possible without the tireless work of the museum staff. So Brenna Hamilton, who's done communications. <laughs> Kenny Martin. And then if you don't know Amanda Meeker, our museum director. Amanda, where are you? She's over here. And to the first partners, staff, and the governor's staff, to both Becky and Becca for all the work that they've done. And, and finally, I'd like to thank two of our prior inductees, former First Lady Mari Maria Schreiber, who had the passion and vision to establish this remarkable event, and Nancy McFadden, whose dedication and love for our museum kept us focused and moving forward. And to the governor and the first partner, who tonight will make this event their own, and we are truly grateful for their partnership and support of the California Museum. So please be prepared to be inspired tonight. Thank you. Please welcome California Hall of Fame presenting sponsor from Visit California, Carolyn Batetta. Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be back with all of you, friends, colleagues, very special guests, of course. At Visit California, our mission is to inspire travel to this great state. And with a state that has so much to offer, it truly is a pillar of our economy. But in the end, what we do at Visit California isn't about hotels or theme parks or iconic destinations. It's about people. And it's about storytelling and, frankly, inspiring people from around the world to explore, push boundaries, step out of their comfort zones in search of the next great adventure, and most importantly, to dream big. There are perhaps very few individuals who inspire bigger dreams than this year's class of Hall of Fame inductees. Thank you to our Hall of Fame inductees for inspiring the world. And thank you to the governor and the first partner for continuing this great tradition. Over the years, Visit California has been proud to sponsor this institution that, like so many things, are only possible here in California. The individuals being honored tonight are shining examples of what it means to be Californian. And their dreams inspire millions of travelers to visit this state. Thank you to the California Hall of Fame for continuing to be a window into the world that we are fortunate to be a part of every day. And again, Congratulations to our Hall of Fame inductees. It's going to be a great night, everybody. Thanks again. Please welcome the California Secretary of State, Alex Padilla. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, let me also welcome everybody to the 13th Annual California Hall of Fame Awards. It's an honor to welcome all of you, not just to this award ceremony, but to the Secretary of State Building Complex. Yes, this is my office. I get to call it home. 
uh, you know, each of the Hall of Fame inductees has put their passions, their talents, and their skills to work to serve their respective communities. And I can't begin to tell you how inspired I am just hearing and learning about their work, their accomplishments, and their contributions to the state of California. You know, through my tenure as Secretary of State uh, and proud host of the Hall of Fame as a venue, uh, I've been in awe of the extraordinary inductees over the years who every year continue to add luster to our great state and to the California Museum itself. So to the inductees, I have no doubt that your stories, now enshrined here in the museum, will serve to inspire, to educate, and to empower visitors of all ages, including the thousands of school children who come to the museum on a tour as they proceed to make a life and an impact of their own. In fact, it's through the stories of our inductees and the powerful exhibits in the California Museum that future generations will be able to learn about and be inspired by both the past and the promise of the future. And a special request of all the inductees to continue to not just do what they do and do what they do great, but to do what they can do to help us get the word out on voter registration. And don't forget to vote. 2020 is a big year. <laughs> and that we need every man, woman, and child living in the state of California to be counted in the 2020 census. It's, you know, it's also fitting that uh, this ceremony takes place on the heels of the 100th anniversary that when California ratified the 19th Amendment, capping nearly a century-long struggle for women's voting rights. <laughs> the decade-long fight might have culminated with the 19th Amendment, but along the way, California women organized and mobilized for the right to vote. And I'm proud to honor the courageous fight for equality that moved our state and our nation towards a more representative and inclusive democracy, because that's what it's all about. Today, we can stand on this stage alongside several amazing women who continue to make our state and our nation a better place. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge a couple that stand out in my mind including, she's been introduced already, Amanda Meeker, uh, head of the museum. <laughs> and the entire museum board of trustees for their commitment to this institution and its mission. And I also want to extend, you can give them a round of applause, yes. <laughs> also want to extend my sincere congratulations to my friend and our first partner, Jennifer Newsom, for her vision behind this beautiful, beautiful evening. Finally, <laughs> finally, a special thank you to all the sponsors who have made this evening and all the museum's programs possible throughout the course of the year. Please enjoy the program. Please welcome your host for this evening, the Governor of California, the Honorable Gavin Newsom, and first partner, Jennifer Siebel Newsom. Good evening, everyone. It is such a treat to be here with all of you. The Governor and I are honored to carry forward the tradition that Maria Shriver and Arnold Schwarzenegger started 13 years ago. And we're also thrilled that some past honorees were able to make it this evening. Thank you to all of you. This is what it's all about, this community. The Hall of Fame is a chance for us to make a statement 
about what this state stands for and inspire the next generation. And tonight we induct 10 extraordinary people into the California Hall of Fame. We put a lot of thought and there are subtle and not so subtle nods to our inductees. Did you see the skate ramp out there? <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> this has been one of my favorite duties yet as first partner of California. And tonight I have the best job of the evening, getting to speak about the remarkable individuals here by my side, not you, honey. <laughs> and it really is a privilege to honor these brave change makers who represent the best of California. Now, of course, with a title like first partner, I'm not afraid to break the mold. And so to help me with this great task, I have enlisted my dear hubby, Mr. Governor, to be our Vanna White for the evening. So without further ado, we will begin inducting the 13th class of the California Hall of Fame. <clears throat> so what happens when young women demand the same athletic opportunities that society gives to young men? Talents are revealed, passions are ignited, and stars are born. Cue in Brandy Chastain. Brandy took up soccer as an eight-year-old in San Jose and quickly excelled. When there was no girls' soccer team at Davis Junior High, well, she joined the boys' team instead. And the rest, as they say, is history. Whether it was being named Soccer America's Freshman of the Year at Cal Berkeley, or bringing home gold in the first Olympic women's soccer competition at the 1996 Summer Games. <laughs> But perhaps most famously, Brandy Chastain led the U.S. women's national soccer team to its second FIFA Women's World Cup title in 1999, scoring the decisive penalty kick in the final game. In peeling off her jersey, she showed the world how to celebrate victory. <laughs> and... <laughs> and equality with a photo that made waves around the world, cementing her icon status in sports history. And there in that photo lies the power of Brandy Chastain, a fearless, hardworking, and fiercely loyal teammate who refuses to be anything less than her authentic self. And she has always used that passion and passed it around to those around her from founding the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative, helping more than 15,000 underserved girls by bringing collegiate female athletes to their playgrounds, to coaching the Santa Clara women's soccer team, the California Girls Thorns club team, and the Bellarmine Boys high school team, to inspiring countless of other young athletes, including one very lucky young girl, me. <laughs> when I played on the under 23 national soccer team, Brandy came to scrimmage with us, and of all the amazing women I got to meet, perhaps none was more impressive or more inspiring than Brandy. <laughs> I mean, you can cry, so I don't have to. She embodied female power, strength, and grace, and she showed us all the true meaning of sportsmanship that day, finding sisterhood in our teammates. So tonight, we celebrate her career as a player, a coach and a mentor for all the girls and boys for whom she continues to inspire please help me in welcoming brandy chastain to the california hall of fame First many times, first World Cup winner, first Olympic gold medalist, and tonight I get to be the first to stand up here and say what an honor and a pleasure and how humbling it is to be sitting with all of you representing California. 
and all the great things that happen in our state and all of um, the ambition, the dreams, the desire, the determination, the languages, the looks that we have here. Uh, I'd like to just clarify and say, I do not coach Santa Clara University women's soccer. That's my husband. I volunteer. <laughs> but thank you for that. I like that. Maybe one day when he, in like 100 years when he retires. Um, but I guess in my, the, my last closing statement, I would say to my son, Jaden, remember where you come from. You're a Californian and you will always be. I love California and thank you very much for this honor. For a state that celebrates diversity, it is fitting that California cuisine was pioneered by an Austrian chef. Wolfgang Puck began cooking as a child in Austria and started formal training at 14. He worked in some of France's best restaurants before arriving in the United States in 1973. Wolfgang burst onto the scene with an adventurous recipe book, combinations of cultures and flavors that created a new cuisine entirely. He wanted to innovate and build an enduring legacy. And so there was only one place to go, California. Wolfgang quickly became a legend in the Golden State's fine dining scene. He launched modern fusion cooking and he opened world famous and world changing restaurants like Spago and Cut Beverly Hills, earning Michelin stars and James Beard awards along the way. And of course, he was always he has always used his considerable platform, not just to elevate fresh and local food, but to elevate local causes as well, raising millions and bringing a priceless spotlight to organizations like Meals on Wheels, the American Cancer Society, the Special Olympics, and the Children's Diabetes Foundation. But perhaps the greatest reward for a chef is the delight of his diners. Millions have enjoyed the best and most memorable meals of their lives thanks to Wolfgang Puck. And in a time when there are too many forces asking us to divide, to separate, and to turn away those who are different from us, Wolfgang Puck's cuisine is a beacon of hope that perhaps we can all break bread together. That the more diversity around the table, the more cultures and flavors you blend together, the better. And for that, it is our honor to induct Wolfgang Puck into the California Hall of Fame. It's certainly a privilege to be here, and congratulations to all the honorees and past honorees, because for us, California is really a dream. I, it me, took me a long time to know where is California. I came here when I was 25 years old. But I really thought once I arrived here, there is no other place in the world I would rather be. I think California has been my home. My wife, Galila, who is here, she immigrated from Ethiopia to come here to call California her home. Our children, Olive, Alexander, Byron, and Cameron, who is in Boston, are all born in California, and they're the first generation California. But mostly what I love about California in my profession is that we have the best of everything. We have the best ingredients, the best wines, we have the best seafood, and I tell all my friends in Chicago or in New York, whatever we don't use, we send it to you over there. <laughs> so, and that's one of the big reasons California is number one. <laughs> number one in so many different things. We could be our own country and be one of the greatest countries in the world, in science, in food, in the arts, you name it, 
California is a leader. California is a leader and people look up to us. And it's amazing to have a governor like Gavin Newsom who really helps us to show the future to the rest of the country because we know in Washington they think different than we do here. <laughs> but sooner or later that will change too. I think we can make the difference. So I know the governor partly invited me because he know he's gonna get some free food. <laughs> but I'm gonna charge him this time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and naturally, I think I have to congratulate one special person who really I look up so much is Helen Turley over here, who makes some of the best wines. <laughs> so which which shows that Jennifer and Gavin really have good taste. <laughs> they have great wine and hopefully some good food too. But I think it's such a pleasure to be here. It's a deep honor for me, immigrating from Austria, coming here and calling California my home and really my success here and my family's success here is really part of a dream come through and I always Tell people California was my dream to be, and California always will be my home and my dream. So thank you, Governor. Thank you, Jennifer. And congratulations to all the honorees. The consequences of war reverberate beyond the battlefield as do the consequences of a history ignored. For the governor and myself, this is one of our guiding principles, that in order to move forward, we must acknowledge the full truth of our past. But to do that requires the work and sacrifice of heroes like Jean Wakasuki Houston, a woman who bravely shared her own experiences to indelibly and beautifully bring to life one of the most painful chapters of California history. Growing up in Inglewood, California, the youngest of 10 siblings, Jean Wakasuki was just seven years old when her family was uprooted from their home. They were imprisoned along with thousands of other Japanese Americans in the throes of anti-Japanese hysteria following the attack on Pearl Harbor. She spent three years a prisoner of her own country at the Manzanar camp in Northern California. Refusing to be defeated by this chapter in her life, Jean wrote Farewell to Manzanar with her husband in 1973, drawing on her experiences during and after her family's imprisonment and making her book one of the first publications to discuss the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Taught in classes across the nation, I myself remember vividly reading the book. Her book sold over one million copies and is now in its 79th printing, forever opening our eyes to the dangerous consequences that follow when we question someone's belonging to his country based on the color of their skin. A lesson we would do well to heed today. It is because of brave voices like hers that our march towards justice continues. And it is because of brave voices like hers that California can continue to be a beacon of light and progress, not in spite of, but because of our past flaws. And for that, it is our honor and it is our privilege to welcome Jean Wakasuki Houston into the California Hall of Fame. Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for that kind and generous introduction. And I also would like to take this time to thank Governor Newsom 
and, his, and Jennifer for their part in adopting this, excuse me, <coughs> the California Hall of Fame. I mean, I think it's extraordinary that we have this event and that it's carrying, it's, it carries on and that we, you know, honor our history, quote, good and bad. In 1971, my nephew, who was attending UC Berkeley, was taking a sociology class. And for the first time in his life, outside of talk and family, heard the word Manzanar. Auntie, he said, you know I was born in Manzanar, and I know nothing of that place. What can you tell me? Well, okay, I'd be happy to tell you, but why don't you ask your parents? He said, I have, but they seem very reluctant, and they don't answer. It's, and I actually feel bad, like I shouldn't be asking them. That's strange, I thought. Whenever our family talked about, quote, camp, which was rare, we joked about things such as the lousy food, food, the dust storms, the communal showers. We talked lightheartedly about outdoor movies. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting a, over this cough. And so for many years, Manzanar remained a dim memory something the family rarely talked about. I used to dream that those years in camp were not real, and it wasn't until 28 years later that I revived those dreams and collaborated with my husband to write about them. And this is how it happened. In 1971, my nephew, who was attending UC Berkeley, came to visit me in Santa Cruz. He was taking a sociology class and for the first time in his life, outside of talk in the family, heard the word Manzanar. Auntie, he said, you know I was born in Manzanar and I don't know anything about that place. What can you tell me? His professor had pointed out the existence of camps, but that was all. Until then, Manzanar had seen more a family myth than an actual fact to my nephew. Okay, I said, but why don't you ask your folks? I have, he said, but they're reluctant like I shouldn't be asking, or there's some skeleton in the closet I'm not supposed to know about. That's strange, I thought. Whenever our family talked about camp, which wasn't often, we joked about things such as the lousy food, the dust storms, the communal showers. We talked lightheartedly about the outdoor movies, baseball games, and school. So I proceeded to tell the same stories in the same superficial way, as if I was sharing some summer camp experience. My nephew looked at me, very quiet, then said, Auntie, that's bizarre. You were locked up. You were in prison. How do you feel about that? For a moment, I was stunned. He asked a question no one had ever asked before, a question I had never dared to ask myself. How did I feel? <coughs> and for the first time in my life, I dropped the cover of humor and nonchalance and allowed myself to feel, and I began to cry. I couldn't stop. My poor nephew was upset. What had he done to send his auntie into these, this hysterics? I realized then why his parents were unable to tell him about Manzanar. At that time, I was auntie to 33 nieces and nephews. Seven had been born in camp. And I was, excuse me, <coughs> And I was certain none knew about that, their birthplace. 
I decided to write a memoir, a history, just for the family. But I found that whenever I tried to write, I broke down and cried and just could not write, the, uh, write my words. So I turned to my husband, a writer and teacher at UC Santa Cruz, and told him of my problem. What memoir, he asked. Now, Jim and I had been married 14 years at that time, and I had known him for five before we married, and I had never told him about Manzanar. He knew of some camp in my background, but I had never revealed my true feelings, and when I did, he said, this is not a story just for your family. It's a story everyone in America should know. Let's work on this together. Thus began a collaboration that lasted for a year. I talked for hours into a tape recorder, and we interviewed family and other attorneys and researched the libraries. The months del spent delving into those three years of my childhood and its aftermath was as powerfully per therapeutic as years with a psychiatrist and a lot cheaper. <laughs> we found there were already 40 books written on the internment, but they were ac academic and political. We found no personal stories from attorneys themselves that address the emotional and psychological damage of that experience. Not only was there the cultural attitude, shikata ganai, it's over and can't be helped. The phenomenon of post-traumatic stress syndrome unknown 30 years ago had silenced most internees. Today we know the experience of death, divorce, sexual abuse, and parental alcoholism can remain buried in the subconscious, subconscious until the memory surfaces years later, usually 30 or 40. I realized the feeling I carried up about the uh, incarceration was one of deep humiliation, like a person who had been raped. You are the victim, yet you are sullied by that experience, ashamed to draw attention to it. For years, I felt guilty for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Somehow, I was responsible for that infamous event. When I asked my mother, why are we in this prison camp? I was then too young to understand war and politics. And she said, it's because we are Japanese. She didn't say anything about a war with Japan. So in my mind, it was not only bad to be Japanese, it was criminal. Feeling guilty for the bombing of Pearl Harbor is similar to the feeling many Americans have for the atomic blast over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thus, crimes of a government can become sins of the people, especially in the mind of an innocent child. Today, there are all too many politicians and irresponsible media who find scapegoats to blame for the country's problems. And more and more, it seems, those scapegoats are immigrants. How often do we hear they are different from us. We, they have no idea of democracy and freedom. They don't and won't speak our language. For many of us who lived through the racism and incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, remember what it was like to have those very words directed against one innocent group. But today, we know better. We have the shoulders of Martin Luther King and others to stand upon. Our consciousness has changed, and because of this, our task is greater. For now, we are in a partnership, a complex relationship, where we must learn about each other. No longer do we live in the simplistic structure of one group authoritatively dominating others. And with these words, I will close.
and say thank you so much, audience, for listening. And I want to thank the governor, State of California, for this award. Thank you. From almost the minute he was born, the Reverend James M. Lawson Jr. refused to accept the prejudice, discrimination, and hate he saw around him. And because of that, our country owes him a great debt of gratitude. The son and grandson of Methodist ministers in Ohio, Reverend Lawson felt called to build a just and peaceful place, often sacrificing himself and his personal safety along the way. After studying the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi and nonviolent resistance in India, Lawson moved to Nashville, Tennessee at the urging of Martin Luther King Jr. and joined the emerging nonviolent direct action movements initiated by Dr. King, Rosa Parks, and others. During that time, he provided his wisdom and counsel across the South and became, as Representative John Lewis said, the architect of the civil rights movement. Whether it was mentoring the struggles in cities like Birmingham and Louisville, or helping organize movements like the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike, the Nashville Sit-In Movement, or the Little Rock Nine, all roads lead back to this legend. It was after his incredible work in the South in the 60s and 70s that the Reverend finally blessed California with his presence. He moved to Los Angeles in 1974 and has been working to make this state a more just place since then. His courage, his willingness to put himself and his body on the line, and his moral clarity in the face of unimaginable pressure to maintain the status quo make him a hero for the ages, a person with shoes so big that it's hard to imagine how wonderfully the world might change if each of us tried ever so slightly to fill them. The moral arc of the universe does indeed bend towards justice, but it does not bend on its own. It requires the strong, courageous grip of people like Reverend Lawson, and for that, it is our esteemed honor to welcome the Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr. into the California Hall of Fame. I want to thank, first of all, the governor and the first lady, the first partner of our state for uh, including me in this eclectic group of people <laughs> for the Hall of Fame. I think this reflects California, the wide spectrum of work that's represented here on this platform, and I want to extend my congratulations to all of them in this class of 2019. Um, I'm tempted to, and I'm going to go ahead and do it. <coughs> uh, for three years, I actually taught soccer, world football, in, in, <laughs> in India. Um, for, for three years as a coach. And uh, so your, your reputation and your name for me has been very important. I continue to follow <laughs> soccer. In any case, I, I am delighted to be a part of California. When we moved here in 1974, I had no idea that it would be such a challenging, wonderful, vast place of experiment for human life. Uh, I personally discovered an intellectual freedom, a spiritual freedom, a moral freedom. I personally discovered a community of people who represented, in fact, the whole human race of the earth for loving and understanding and, pr and steady practice. 
I've here contributed to that in some ways. Los Angeles today has 800,000 members of labor unions in part because of my work of 30 years there. <laughs> because I'm convinced, I'm convinced that what we think to be more uh, perhaps issues that cannot be resolved, I'm convinced that every man and every woman and every child in California across the face of the earth can have economic, social, political, religious equality of every form if we human beings would learn the lessons from our past and do them. <laughs> so I'm proud to count myself a citizen of this state and um, a resident of Los Angeles for these last almost 40, 45 years or so. And um, I want to simply say to you, we, we have a wonderful governor <laughs> and a wonderful example of a, f of a family as a governor's family in, this, in, in, in our state. And I want to see that governor's image and work become uh, illustration of what political leadership can do in our, not alone in our state, but in our nation. Desperately we need it. In 1969, people across the world sat captive in front of their televisions as they watched a man land on the moon for the first time. One such viewer was 22-year-old France Cordova, who had just graduated from Stanford University with a degree in English and a published a short published novel. Back in high school, she was a science enthusiast who petitioned her school to allow her and four other girls into the boys only physics class. But it was then, after she saw the moon landing, that she decided to become an astrophysicist. Cordova went on to earn her PhD in physics from Caltech in 1979. She was one of just two women in her class of 18. Since then, she has gone on to have a storied and impressive career, one that perhaps even Neil Armstrong might envy. In 1993, Cordova became the youngest person and first woman ever to serve as NASA's, NASA's chief scientist, where she was awarded the agency's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal. And in 2013, she was nominated by President Barack Obama to become the 14th director of the National Science Foundation, where she still serves today. For decades, she has always given back, specifically to the California community a member of Stanford University's Multicultural Alumni Hall of Fame, a former teacher and vice chancellor at UC Berkeley, and chancellor emeritus at UC Riverside. Yet perhaps most importantly, she has been an inspiration to countless young scientists, especially our young women. For the Latina community in particular, she is a Shiro, the embodiment of one of my favorite phrases, if you can see it, you can be it. So tonight, we get to see her deliver a very special message from a magnificent place. Accepting on her behalf is her brother, Fred Cordova, who will join us as we induct Dr. France Cordova into the California Hall of Fame. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I'm here in, at McMurdo Station, Antarctica, where the National Science Foundation has a field station to support the logistics of the U.S. Antarctica program. And tomorrow we'll be taking off for the South Pole, where we support a lot of science, including astrophysics, which is my field. I want to thank Governor Newsom and first partner Jennifer Newsom for this great honor of being inducted into the California Hall of Fame. And I want to recognize all of the other inductees. And uh, also my family, a lot of my family members are there with you this evening. 
I was born in Europe of a father who was a West Point graduate and a mother from New York. And uh, they went to help in the relief efforts after the war. And after they did that for a while, then my father wanted to come to California to start a business. And that business is still thriving. It's now in its third generation of family leadership. Um, my mom also started two businesses here in California. Well, I had uh, great schooling in uh, California. I went to Bishop Amat High School where I represented the school at California Girl State and then later to Stanford University where I majored in English and the California Institute of Technology where I got a PhD in physics. I've had a, a great fun career in different parts of the country but some of my favorite experiences were right here in California, especially at UC Santa Barbara, where I was Vice Chancellor for Research, and at UC Riverside, where I was Chancellor and was able to initiate the first medical school in over 40 years west of the Mississippi. And that school today has a great diversity of medical students and is really serving the Inland Empire. As the 14th director of the National Science Foundation, I'm proud that we are able to support great researchers right here in California doing science and engineering research that really makes a difference for the California citizens. I want to thank my family for being at the ceremony to receive this award on my behalf. I love you all. And I want to congratulate the other inductees. Tony. I haven't seen any skateboarders here, but Wolfgang, the food is pretty good. And last night, someone put a poem of Maya Angelou on my pillow. It's pretty hard to follow up on that. Uh, my sister is incredible. Uh, Governor and first partner Newsom, thank you so much for this uh, award. On be, I'm accepting it on behalf of my sister. Uh, my family's here, my sister Lou and my daughter uh, Caitlin. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be among these uh, just incredible people here, the fellow honorees. Um, when um, I think about France, I think about inspiration. Uh, she inspired me in so many ways. And, and that's something that really needs to come out tonight about how she inspires young women and Latinas. My father was born in Mexico. He's an immigrant. Uh, we like to say somos lepticanos because my mother was uh, Irish, my father uh, <laughs> Mexican. Um, she's just, she's amazing ins inspiration. And every uh, time I look at the stars, when you can see them in Los Angeles, which isn't very often, uh, I, I'm thankful and grateful for what she inspired in me, and that's the pursuit of why. And that is the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of things around us. And if we can all focus on pursuing why more and why things are happening and, and, and fix them, this will be a, a much better uh, world. And I uh, want to thank uh, France for being such an inspiration. She's an incredible um, She's an incredible a leader, an incredible scientist, an incredible mother, and an incredible sister. So we love you, France. Thank you. Many a trip to the emergency room has started with the fateful words, let me try your skateboard. <laughs> but putting young Tony Hawk onto a skateboard was like putting a fish into water. He was simply a natural. Hawk's brother gave him his first skateboard at the age of nine. When he stepped on it and rolled down the driveway, he looked back at his brother and shouted, how do I turn? But Tony was a quick learner. By age 12, he was winning amateur contests throughout the state, and at age 14, he turned pro. By 16, Tony was the world's best competitive skateboarder. And at 25, he had competed in 103 pro contests, winning an astonishing 73 times. Hawk is what they call the king of vert skating, where he explodes out of a half pipe ramp, reaching a tense frozen pinnacle high in the air before falling back towards the ramp and making a smooth re-entry that is truly awe-inspiring. 
He was even the first skateboarder to land a 900, the holy grail of professional skateboarding. That's right. <laughs> to see him fly graceful and athletic is to understand why he was crowned vert skating's world champion 12 years in a row. And it is also to understand how he turned a California suburban rite of passage, often overlooked and under-respected, into a worldwide phenomena inspiring millions of skaters along the way. A prolific philanthropist, his Tony Hawk Foundation has given more than 9.2 million to skateboard park, skate park projects across all 50 states, helping more than six million skaters a year enjoy the sport that has been so central to his life. And let's face, yes. <laughs> and let's face it, he makes us feel pretty cool just having him here. <laughs> so with that, it is our honor to induct Tony Hawk into the California Hall of Fame. Thank you, Governor Jennifer. Um, I'm hugely honored. Uh, to answer France about Antarctic, I agree there is no skateboarding there. Um, but I do know the first person to surf in the Antarctic because it was my brother Steve. It's <laughs> <That's> true. <clears throat> Who also, as you heard, gave me my first skateboard. Um, and we have since given it, it to the Smithsonian. Um, so that was a huge honor. Um, I accept this honor, not just on my own behalf, but I think on behalf of my sports, I feel like this is more of a recognition of how far we've come. And when I say my sports, I, say, I, I consider that action sports, skateboarding, surfing, snowboarding, BMX, motocross, you probably all know, know them as extreme, thanks to ESPN. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that it's a coming of age for us. Uh, it's something that you know we've struggled for acceptance and awareness. And I feel like now, I mean, skateboarding will be in the Olympics next year, so we'll surfing. Um, and <clears throat> a lot of that has to do with growing up in California because I grew up here. It was, uh, there was a support system in place. We grew up, you know, skateboarding was spawned from surfing. And so there was support in that sense, but also just uh, growing up in San Diego, um, the weather enabled me to, to practice year round and really to hone my skills. And I think that's, that's a big part of why I was so successful. Um, and also, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, skateboarding is inclusive, it's diverse. I feel like it's such a healthy th outlet for kids, not, not necessarily for them to make careers out of it, but just to teach themselves about um, self-reliance, about self-discipline, about perseverance, the value of persistence, and um, sharing ideas. And so uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that you're recognizing me and, for, and skateboarding in general um, with this award. And, um, if I may, uh, I do have a, a funny topical story about California. Uh, I was, it involves other inductees, that's why. Um, I uh, got invited a long time ago to the California Adventures Grand Opening VIP party uh, in Disneyland, which also was super cool for me because I was still kind of a, you know, I was still kind of the odd man out in those respects. And uh, they said, yeah, just go to any restaurant and they'll just serve you food. Okay, cool, so we went to a restaurant we're seated in a booth, and Wolfgang approached our table and said, I'm gonna cook for you. And I was like, that's the coolest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> um, and uh, there were communal tables, so the, another group walked in, and Jack Nicholson sat at our table. <laughs> and I thought, this is the coolest thing again that's ever happened. Um, we played it cool, uh, and uh, we ate very quickly, kind of quietly, but cordially. And uh, he left, and my, my now wife grabbed the uh, glass that he was drinking out of and put it in her purse. <laughs> so I apologize that we stole some, um, so, you know, we stole some dinnerware, but if you want it back, I'm gonna say that I lost it. Uh, so anyway, thank you, uh, California, um, California Hall of Fame, and uh, what can I say? You know, it was really cool to give uh, 
my, our skateboard to the Smithsonian, um, but it, we didn't make that skateboard, we just wrote it, and so we actually made California our home, so this is a cooler award. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> As you may have heard, my husband likes to think he knows a thing or two about winemaking. So you know this nomination didn't come lightly. But what you may not have heard is that Helen Turley's family actually didn't drink wine when she was growing up. Yet from that implausible start, Turley quickly became a master vintner and groundbreaking figure, literally, of California wine. Turley came to California after earning her BS in 1976 from Cornell University where she studied viticulture and fermentation science. After many successful years as a consultant in the industry, she and her husband found a site for her own venture off the Sonoma coast called Marcuson Vineyard. Now, for most of the history of California winemaking, the Sonoma coast region was considered second rate, and it was not the first acreage that popped into the mind of a vintner with world-class aspirations. But, as with so many of our inductees in this Hall of Fame, Helen Turley didn't accept conventional wisdom. Armed with vision, expertise, and confidence, she moved forward and created one of California's most respected labels, achieving what the governor likes to call cult wine status. And in the process, she elevated all of California wine to international acclaim. She is one of the most respected winemakers in American history in a profession where 90% of vintners are men. Yes, for her whole career, Helen Turley has been a woman in a man's world, and she has shown all the men how it's done while mentoring the next generation of female winemakers to follow suit. So when we get to the after party, we will raise a glass to her achievements. And for now, let's all join together to welcome Helen Turley into the California Hall of Fame. One can acknowledge, as Emily Dickinson did, that fame is a bee. It has a song, it has a sting, ah too, it has a wing. But it is wonderful to be recognized for 40 years of doing what I love, which is growing and making wine in California. California's Edenic Mediterranean climate is a special place for wine growing, as wine lovers the world over recognize as they seek out our wines. This special place deserves our love. Now it deserves our help in protecting its land, water, air, and most importantly, its people from those who would destroy them all. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Jennifer, for this honor, which I share with my husband, John Wetlaufer, and the Avena family. often asked, why you crying? George Lopez has been incredibly successful in making us all laugh. A California man through and through, he was born in Mission Hills, Los Angeles, graduated from San Fernando High School, and still resides in LA to this day. But his excellent choice in living locale is just a small part of why George is up here tonight. Mr. Lopez has been breaking the mold and breaking down barriers in living rooms across America for the span of his career. <laughs> of Mexican descent, George is one of television's most visible Latinos, perhaps most famously creating and starring in the hit TV sitcom, The George Lopez Show, the first network show. the first network show with a Mexican-American lead. 
And through the work of his incredible George, George Lopez Foundation, he is a fixture across many communities in Southern California, improving and changing the lives of countless children, adults, and military families. But perhaps even more than his visibility, it is his bravery and his willingness to always speak truth to power that we honor him tonight. When his show was canceled without much reason and, it, and without much warning, he famously and publicly challenged his network by asking, so a Chicano can't be on TV, but a caveman can? And he hasn't stopped speaking out since. In today's divisive times, George Lopez continues to be a powerful voice on issues affecting marginalized communities from family separation to police violence to gun control and he does it in an industry where that is far from the norm. He reminds us of what we have in common, all while giving people a good and much needed laugh along the way. So tonight, it is our esteemed honor to welcome George Lopez into the California Hall of Fame. Thank you. That's uh, <clears throat> very kind. Thank you. Um, in 2005, uh, Wolfgang Puck asked me to perform at his Christmas party, and he said, "You'll be fine. They love you. You have." <laughs> they 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 hated me, but <laughs> I made a friend, Mr. Wolfgang Puck. So thank you for always being kind to me, and uh, I don't think I'll be doing that anytime soon, but. <laughs> Uh, he's always been great to me. You know, when, when people ask me what part of uh, Mexico I'm from, I'm proud to say uh, California. Um, I say the capital, Los Angeles. The, you know, I, uh, you know, there's, I just, you know, what, I, I'm just really honored to, uh, to be able to be here. That picture of me as a young boy, I spent a lot of time alone. And uh, now at that school for the last 15 years, every Christmas I go there, I buy all the toys and I hand every one of those kids in that school a toy because they did it for us. A lot of the toys were new. But uh, I do that because that's what people do when people help and everybody needs to help a little bit now. And uh, it's still a great, it's the greatest country and it's the greatest state and nothing makes me prouder than to be from California, and nothing makes me uh, uh, happier than to have Dolores Huerta in the audience because <laughs> when I was a uh, young boy, I saw the farm workers outside of Safeway, and they said, do not eat grapes. We didn't eat grapes. <laughs> they said, don't drink Coors. The three years I was in junior high, didn't touch a drop. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I didn't have a father. The game of golf taught me the things that I think of. a father would have taught me. I've been playing since 1981. I started playing golf by hitting lemons in my backyard. And uh, I was in a California commercial from Pebble Beach on the seventh hole, which is one of the most famous holes. So that's, uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm honored to be in here and I'm not going anywhere. And this is, uh, you know, the greatest uh, place politically. We're not going anywhere, and this country does not run without the labor of Latinos. And I would say to anybody, do not bite the hand that feeds you. Thank you, guys. Dr. Maya Angelou, as always, said it best. All my work, my life, everything I do is about survival. Not just bare, awful, plotting survival, but survival with grace and faith. 
It is that grace and faith that we honor tonight in the California Hall of Fame. There is much we know about the late Maya Angelou, and she has perhaps too many achievements to do justice to them here. Winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Arts. Recipient of three Grammys and a nomination for the Pulitzer Prize. A famed poet, a grand orator, and a civil rights leader. She is a writer with an unmatchable ability to at once pierce our hearts and uplift our souls. Yet even her lesser known accomplishments are somehow just as remarkable. Though born in the South, she moved to Oakland at age 14 and soon after became the first black cable car conductor in San Francisco. In her early 20s, she also formed a dance team in San Francisco with a man you may have heard of, Alvin Ailey. And just three years after her groundbreaking 1969 autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Birds Sing, she wrote the film Georgia, Georgia, which was the first screenplay ever to be written by a black woman. The list goes on and on. Her achievements seemingly endless, her legacy infinitely enduring, and through it all, one remarkable thread. Despite unimaginable pain and suffering, still she rose. Still she saw the beauty in humanity. Still she worked toward a brighter future. And still she brought us all with her to a higher calling and a higher place. And so it is our esteemed honor to bestow this award upon her today. And it is with great pleasure that we welcome her son, Guy Johnson, to join us as we induct the late Dr. Maya Angelou into the California Hall of Fame. First, I want to say it took no talent to be her son. <laughs> In the name of Dr. Maya Angelou's family, I'd like to thank Governor Newsom and the first partner and all those who voted to include her in this 13th class of the California Hall of Fame inductees, which we truly appreciate this amazing honor. As I was growing up, I really didn't understand my mother or who she was. Even in my family, my grandparents, great aunts and uncles thought she was strange. <laughs> and frankly, she was one of the most daring people I knew. She spouted ideas and concepts that didn't become popular until 20 years later. For example, she called herself a black person in 1950, when everyone else used the term colored and thought black was a derisive and negative term. My mother would wear her hair natural and wear African dress, which embarrassed me, and always elicited snide remarks from other people of color. She would take me aside and warn me about the insidious qualities of racism and prejudice, and then tell me to always fight against the prison of ignorance. In my adolescence, I actually thought she was a troublemaker <laughs> because she was always getting blackballed and fired from jobs from, for speaking up when she saw unfairness and injustice around her. Sometimes it wasn't even for herself, but other people. She used to say she would not let either unfairness or injustice happen in front of her without protest, because justice was so important that it must be fought for whenever it was encroached upon. She would tell me that the quality of justice one wants in their life begins at their doorstep. So, 
in this time of racial divisiveness with impulsive presidential tweets ricocheting across the social media ether. Remember all of those who gave their sweat and their blood to make this country stay true to the tenets of its constitution. This is a fight that still must be won. So don't be a prisoner of ignorance. And remember, justice ends or begins at your doorstep. Guy, you take after your mother. <laughs> Powerful words. <laughs> Thank you. A few years ago, an excited colleague of mine came running up to me out of breath and a bit out of her mind. Guess who just posted about the mask you live in? My documentary about American masculinities. Rue Paul. The office erupted in the biggest screams I have ever heard, and I have four children, mind you. I was overjoyed. There is perhaps no person who has done more to dismantle the limiting man box we put our boys and men into than Rue Paul. And he's been doing it with a plum, living authentically out loud since he was a young boy. Born in San Diego, California, Rue Paul first burst onto the stage as the front man of punk bands, including Rue Paul and the U-Hauls, before taking his talent, performing music and drag to the clubs of New York City. He soon achieved international fame with the single, Supermodel, You Better Work, from his debut album. That's right. <laughs> but like I said, never put RuPaul in a box. He has achieved success in every medium he has attempted, from releasing over 15 studio albums to publishing three books to being the first man ever to be the face of a major cosmetics campaign. And then, of course, there is cinema. RuPaul has appeared in more than 15 fi 50 films and television shows, both in and out of drag. But there's nothing like his most remarkable achievement, RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> An Emmy Award-winning reality TV competition, the show took drag subculture and brought it mainstream. And it brought its joyfulness, inclusivity, and celebration of all of humanity with it. RuPaul has simply made American media and our larger culture a more inclusive place. <laughs> and he has done it with incomparable fabulousness. He has transformed hearts and minds, and he has saved lives too with countless young people finally seeing themselves reflected in our media, grateful for the community where they too can feel at home. Mama Ru taught us that if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? And for that, it is our privilege to welcome the final inductee into the 13th class of the California Hall of Fame, Ru Paul Andre Charles. Thank you, Governor Newsom. Thank you, Jennifer Newsom. This is a great honor. And uh, thank you to all the other inductees. Give them a big round of applause. <clears throat> this is really lovely and beautiful. And thank all of you guys for being here. I am a Californian born and raised in San Diego, California. You know, uh, my parents, uh, these hillbillies from Louisiana <laughs> moved to uh, to California in the 50s, and I was I was born in San Diego. And you know they were part of the great migration of black folks from the South, you know. Um, but they were the last wave of. There's a fantastic book by Isabel Wilkerson called the 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 sun the warmth 
of other sons. You guys know that. It's, and they were part of this last wave of people. You know, a lot of people, most people stayed where, stayed put. But, you know, the real frontiers, the real, the real trailblazers moved away and moved to California. So California has this incredible spirit to it of, of tr this frontiersmen of, of trailblazers, people who aren't afraid to take on a challenge. And I am so proud to be a part of that legacy and to take that, that, that ingenuity and spirit with me and carry that torch around the world, wherever I go. And this honor here is, is such a, a beautiful uh, a way to, to commemorate this, the, the spirit of all the people who, who brought this to California, who, t who took this spirit to California. And I am proud to be a part of that. Thank you guys so much. And, and let's carry that spirit with us from this day on. How about that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And to my lovely husband right here, George Labar. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, all of you, and all the inductees. And, and now you know why they call our first partner. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for an outstanding job tonight, doing all the hard work. I enjoyed my time as Vanna White. Uh, and I also enjoyed this evening, that, that, that spirit, that pride, Rue and others have referenced this notion of the dream, the perseverance, the daring, the troublemaking, all the adjectives that were used to describe uh, those that are up on stage and describe the state uh, that we are so proud of, the state we love so deeply. It's an interesting fact. Some of you heard me say this before, but it can be repeated often for a reason, and that is it's special. There are only two dreams. There are the American dream and the California dream. No other state attaches itself to a dream. That's special. We talk about California's dream in the context of being a state, not just of dreamers, but doers, of an entrepreneurial spirit, people that pride themselves on being on the leading and cutting edge. We love to say about our state, the future happens here first. We're America's coming attraction. And, and I think that's demonstrable in the examples and the lives and the journeys they've been on here at stage. I said it uh, when we had the reception earlier, we're also a state that holds something in distinction as well. We're the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. And I don't think it's an exaggeration at all to say that the world looks to us, looks to each and every one of you to see it's possible to live together, to advance and prosper together across every conceivable and imaginable difference. What makes California great today is that we don't tolerate that diversity. We celebrate that diversity. That was on display tonight. And so it's in that spirit with that deep sense of pride I thank you all for being here tonight, and I welcome the 13th class, 2019 Hall of Fame inductees. Thank you all very, very much. And now let's bring in the band, and we'll go to the reception. Thank you all very much.